Hello everyone and welcome to 7 PyTorch tips you should definitely know if you're a machine learning researcher or a student or engineer, any of those, or if you're just learning about machine learning now, trying to figure out how to use PyTorch. These are 7 tips you should definitely know, I think. Some of these will be obvious, some of them are less obvious you might not have heard of, but either way, let's get into it starting with number 1, or before number 1, our imports, just going to import Torch and this time module, but now getting into number 1 reading tensors directly on the target device. This is a media, I mean, this isn't the worst thing to do, but it's something I see a lot that can save you a little bit of time. So what do I mean by this? Let me go ahead and copy some code in here. So this is an example, specifically right here, of something I see people doing a lot. They'll create some sort of tensor, right? So in this case, we're creating a tensor of ones. We have 1,000 by 64 by 64. If we are going to run this a hundred times and we go ahead and run this real quick, and we might need to run it twice because it's as it's warming up. So yeah, we'll go ahead and run this twice, but we'll get an idea of how long this generally takes. So about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 seconds, right? This isn't very good though, because what you can actually do is instead of creating it on the CPU and then moving it to the GPU is you can actually just do it on the GPU straight up. And the way you do that is super simple. Whenever you're creating a tensor, you pass in this variable or this parameter device, and you can set that to CUDA. Now, if you have specific or multiple GPUs, you can do like CUDA 0 or CUDA 1 to specify that. But if we go ahead and do this, let's see the time difference. Oh my, look at that, 0 0.009 seconds. That's clearly a huge difference. Yeah, so that's about a 50 times difference just from that super minor thing. So if you are ever creating tensors, make sure to create them directly on the device you want them to be on. And unless you don't know ahead of time, then of course it's fine to do this. But when you can do this, you should be creating them directly on the device you want. That is it for that tip. So now down to number two, using sequential layers when possible. This isn't something that really gives you any speed ups or anything as far as I'm aware, but it is a lot cleaner code. Let me go ahead and give us a model to start with. So this is just an example model I put together. You could go ahead and look through it really quickly. It's pretty standard. We have an input layer that takes in uh, two, two floats. We then have a middle layer that is just 16 uh, neurons. And then we have an output layer that outputs three outputs floats. So we can go ahead and then pass this through in our forward method. It's pretty standard, right? We just pass it through a layer and activation, a layer and activation, and then our output and return that. Now we can go ahead and make sure that this works by doing something like this. Here we create our example model, print it out to see the shape, and then make sure that we get the right shape for the output. So I forgot to run that. And there we go. You can see it right here, and it's working perfectly fine. Now, this works, but there is a better way to do this. And the better way to do this is to use a sequential layer. A sequential layer essentially packs together multiple layers as such. You can see we create a sequential layer, and then we pass in each of our individual layers, the linear layer, the, the activation, the next layer, the activation, and such. And what's really nice about this is when we go to our forward method to pass through our input, we only have to call this sequential layer once because it's only one layer. This is just a lot cleaner and easier. If you, you know, if you compare these two, clearly this one is a lot shorter. So this is definitely something I would recommend using. Not to mention, you might be like wondering what if I need to access these individual layers? Well, you can still do that even when you're using a sequential layer. If you print it out, you can see, I forgot to run this again. You can see that each of these individual layers are still captured here and they're not lost. So this is something I would highly recommend. Tip number three is to not make lists of layers. And I see this very commonly. So let me give you an example of what I mean. So here is a model similar to the last one we had, except for in this case, we have mid layers. So these are all our layers except for our input and output layers. And we loop for five times, and each time we append a linear layer and an activation. So this is going to end up being 10 different sort of things we pass our input through. And what ends up happening is once we pass it through all that, then we pass it through the output layer. As you can see right here, we loop through each of the mid layers and then output the output layer. This, I think, actually trips a lot of people up because it's not something that I've seen super well documented. But take a look, pause the video real quick, and take a look if you can't tell what's wrong with this see if you can figure out what's wrong. You might not be able to figure it out if you haven't worked that much with PyTorch before. But if you, if you have your guess, let's go ahead and I'll give you an example. If we actually try to run this like normal, what you'll see, so we're creating a model, right? Creating a model and then running through some random input. It actually, we get an output, 
So this works perfectly fine. What, so, so what's the issue here? And the issue is what happens when we try to move these over to the GPU. So if we create our input on CUDA, right? So on the GPU, and then we move our model over to the GPU, and then we try to pass this through, what happens? Oh no, we get an error. So why could that be? It says tensor for out is on CPU, tensor for argument number one, blah, 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 blah. Essentially what this is saying is this, expected them to be on the GPU. We're passing in a GPU input, but some of the parameters for the model are still on the CPU. Now, this shouldn't be the case, right? Because we just turned our model into a GPU model here. So what's actually happening? Well, the way PyTorch works is under the hood, whenever you create a layer like up here, this actually gets registered within the model and that layer is kept track of so that whenever you put the model on the GPU, for example, it can individually take all the parameters and move them over to the GPU. When you create them and you do this sort of thing, you append them to a list, these never actually get properly tracked. So this is an issue, right? Because if we ever want to switch to a different device, we're gonna have trouble. There is actually a super easy way to counteract this. And this is closely following the last tip of sequential layers. One thing we can do, and this is also a lot cleaner, is once we create our layers in the list, we can pass them in to a sequential layer. So our mid layers are now actually just a sequential layer where we are unpacking our each layer in this list of layers. And now we can call this just like normally. So let me go ahead and show you an example. So on this, we're moving, we have inputs on the GPU. We're moving the model to the GPU. We go ahead and try this out and it works perfectly fine. So that is tip three. This is probably the least common thing or the least com the, the thing I've run into the most that's the hardest to solve here because it's not exactly obvious what's happening. So hopefully this is something you can put to use next time you're building a model. Next up, we can move on to tip number four. Tip number four is actually another thing I don't see used super commonly and that's why I wanted to call it out and that is distributions. PyTorch is great for all this model building, having all these different layers defined that you can use, having pre-processing. One thing I don't see people using very often though are distributions, which are super you know, common in machine learning, which I, is why I'm a little surprised that I don't see these more often. So let's go ahead and do some setup. We're just creating this example model. This was the first model we put together, getting a random input and then getting some output. And the output is just you know a, a random sort of answer right here. One thing we can do though, is we can actually pass these into a distribution function. So for the case, uh, or class, for the case of this example, I'm going to be using a categorical distribution. PyTorch supports all sorts of distributions, so definitely check it out on the documentation. But just to give you guys an example, that's what I'm going to do. The one thing we can go ahead and do is we can take our logits here, right? And for example, maybe these logits, maybe this is five examples, and each one of these examples can be three possible classes, and these are the raw outputs, but we want them to be like probabilities of this being the zeroth class, this being the first class, and this being the second class, and then the same thing for each of these examples. Well, one way we could do this is do like a softmax layer and then do these things. That works perfectly fine. Another thing we can do though, is we can take this categorical distri distribution and pass in our logic. So you can also pass in raw probabilities, that works perfectly fine too. And you see we get a distribution out. The interesting part though, is what we can do with this distribution. For one, it will automatically convert these, these raw logits into probabilities. If we call it this.probs, you can see these are each probabilities in each row that add up to one. So super neat and super easy way of getting these probabilities right off the bat. That is not all though. We can also do you know, very common functions you would expect with distributions. For example, sampling, we can take samples. So here we take a sample, one from each example. That's why we have five. We can sample this multiple times. And as you will see, the output is random or at least random and based on these probabilities. And then one more example I'll show you is let's say we want to take the KL divergence between two different layers well, we can create two different categorical dis distributions, one for the first example and one for the second example. And then we can just simply call KL divergence distribution one and distribution two, and we get out a number. There are actually more things you can do with this, things like calculating the entropy and such. I find this super helpful, especially when I'm working on reinforcement learning, I'll often use categorical distributions 
As for the outputs, it lets you sample actions easily. It lets you calculate the entropy when you're creating certain algorithms that need that. One example would be proximal policy optimization. So I highly recommend checking these out. There are lots of cool distributions that PyTorch supports, and I used to hand code these not knowing these existed, so I wanted to share them all. Moving on to item number five, it is using the detach method on long-term metrics. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. The first thing we'll want to do is some setup. The setup just creates an instance of this model. Then we create a random batch of data. So these are just different input batches. And we create a criteri criterion or a loss function. We're just going to use MSE. It's kind of irrelevant. It's just to demonstrate a point here. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is create a sort of typical training loop I would see. Uh, so in, in this training loop, right, we have four batch in each or for each batch we have, we want to pass the batch of data through the model, get an output, calculate the loss, and then we do optimization after this. This is pretty standard, right? When you're calculating the loss, you want to append it to a list so that you can print it out later, or maybe you want to log this or do something with it, but you want to keep track of it so you can graph it or, or whatever, right? This works, right? So if we go ahead and run this, or I keep forgetting to run the earlier one, but if we go ahead and run this now, we print out the losses and we can see that we do get, you know, losses. We get numbers here. Works perfectly fine. So what is the issue? And this is, again, if you don't see what the issue is immediately here, I recommend pausing the video and thinking where this might have issues. Hopefully you maybe thought about that for a second. Maybe you didn't. But the issue here is that if we look at each of these losses, you can see they have a number representing the loss, but also a grad F in. What is this? This is the gradient function. I, I believe that's what it stands for. And essentially what it is, is it tracks all of the gradients through the entire model so that if we ever want to call backwards on this and do like backwards propagation, we can go ahead and do that. The issue is if we just want this scalar number right here to keep track of the loss, we actually have more than that here because we have this whole gradient function. We don't really want that, right? That, that's a lot of extra data to be keeping. We want to get rid of that whenever we're storing it for something simple like this. This could lead to a memory leak and that, that is one reason it's important to fix this. And a super easy way to do it is to just do this. When we append a loss, detach it. Using the detach function, we'll actually detach it from the gradient graph. And therefore, if we go ahead and do this, we'll get just these scalars. Another thing you can do is do dot item. And what dot item will do is uh, this. It will convert these just into normal PyTorch floats instead of 10. Totally up to you what you want to do, but this is a better way to do it. And this isn't just for the loss. Whenever you have these sorts of variables that don't need to have gradients applied, I'd recommend detaching them, or there are ways to create them without tracking degrade in the first place. That probably would not be a good idea for the loss though. Next to item number six. This is something that I also don't see super commonly, and it has to do with cleaning up models from the GPU. Very commonly, I will be working on some sort of project with a huge model, especially like uh, these huge language models nowadays, like GP2 or computer vision models especially are very big because, you know, big images. And I've always had a hard time cleaning it up from the GPU. Theoretically, what you should be able to do so is this right here. So let's see, we create an example model and then we delete the model, right? This model is created on the GPU. We delete it. It should get cleaned up from the GPU. Sometimes this works, but what I actually find is this doesn't always help because the model is cached on the GPU. It's supposed to be just be overridden when new data needs to take its place, but that doesn't always happen in practice. I don't know why, it might be a glitch with PyTorch or maybe I was just reading old documentation, but there is one thing we can do to fix this. We can go ahead and import GC for garbage collection. And then after we delete the model, we can take two more steps to make sure that this is fully deleted from the GPU. First is to call gc.collect to make sure that this item has been picked up by garbage collection. And then the next thing is to call Porch.cuda.empty cache, and this will actually empty the cache on the GPU. So if the model is still on the GPU but doesn't have any references or it's been garbage collected, well, this should get rid of it fully so that next time maybe we are using a Jupyter notebook and we keep recreating this model, it will help us not run out of memory on our GPU instead of having to like restart the whole runtime and do all this, you know, really annoying stuff. We can just run this one cell and then get back to it. 
if we go ahead and do this, I don't really have an example here to show you, uh, but one thing you could do would be like call NVIDIA SMI, the function, and, and see that it's no longer taking up space on you. Super helpful thing to bookmark. And now we're here to the seventh and the last tip. This one's probably actually the simplest of all of them, but super important. And I mentioned it because I personally forget this all the time. And that is to call eval before testing a model. If you have not heard of this before, if I go ahead and create a model here, one thing that you'll actually see is, let's say we do some like training right below this, right? I'm not actually gonna do it, but we do training and then we want to do testing. Well, before you actually test your model, what you should do is you should call the eval function. on. And what this will do is it will change the behavior of certain layers, right? Uh, some example or one example would be dropout, right? Dropout is something you only want in training and it helps train your model to sort of generalize more or not overfit at the very least. But in evaluation mode, you want that to not be the case. You don't want to penalize your model for stupid things like that. You want it to be at its best performance because you know at that point overfitting isn't really bad. And then if you ever need to train again, you can call dot train on the model to switch it back into training mode. So this is something you should definitely be doing whenever you're testing your model. And I do have a full list of cases where this is important. I would just do it always just to make sure, but these are the what it affects. It affects dropout layers, batch normalization, RNN sometimes, and lazy variants of layers. This is, this is the source for this. You can double check yourself the, the response. It's just a stack overflow response. But whenever you're testing a model or if you're deploying it, do make sure, well, if you're deploying it, I don't know why you're doing that in PyTorch. <laughs> but if you're, ever, if you're ever doing any sort of training or anything and then doing testing, make sure you call eval mode after or once before you start the testing and then training if you ever go back to train or dot train if you ever go back to train. That is it for these tips though. I hope these seven tips were things that you thought were helpful or that you could use. I'm going to have a link in the description to this GitHub and definitely make sure to subscribe to the channel if you thought this was helpful. It really means a lot. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to catch you next time.